Um, so welcome to the Symmetry flight deck. Uh, I'll start off by saying this flight deck is common between the G400, 500, 600, 700, and 800. Uh, the 700 and 800 incorporate our most recent variation of this flight deck with some, some uh, improvements. Uh, highlighting the flight deck are the side sticks. Uh, they're active control side sticks, the first in the industry. We introduced those with the G500. So the two of you grab the side sticks and you can feel each other on there. Now, you're used to mechanically linked, you know, small airplane controls or helicopter controls. That's, yeah. that's not unusual, but in, in side sticks it is. Boeing doesn't have it, Airbus doesn't have it, uh, Dassault doesn't have it. And it actually has led to some accidents where uh, flight crews were putting in um, conflicting control inputs. Air France 447, they held the airplane in the stall uh, for minutes uh, and crashed it. Uh, because one pilot was full forward, one pilot was full aft, and they were debating, and uh, they didn't know it. So when we did side sticks, we knew we had to do that. But that's not its only advantage. We can tailor the way it feels and flies through the forces in the side stick, the damping, the breakout, the frictions, the throws, the, the shape of the displacement of the stick versus the reaction of the airplane. So we can make it really smooth around neutral, and we can make it more sensitive when you have to counter a gust, okay. you know, on landing, for example. So there's a lot you can do with it. Side stick. That's the first thing. Uh, we have 10 touch screens, so uh, we jumped full into touch screens, uh, which is you know an industry trend everywhere. Um, the great thing about the touch screens uh, is you'll notice they're not flush mounted. Uh, one of our concerns with touch screens early on was uh, how will they operate in turbulence? You guys have probably seen that in your airplanes, uh, um, you know, Garmin things like that. I have my small private airplane. It's challenging, and when it's really bumpy out, so. They're not flush mounted, so you can anchor your hand. And they're also not capacitive, See, so nothing's happening when I touch it real lightly. They're resistive, so I have to put like a three ounce force into it. Um, and if I land on something I don't like, I can slide off of it and it doesn't actuate. So, uh, very effective in turbulence, but it's very convenient. So there's so much you can do with touch screens. You can put a lot of information, like our phase of lights. So I just swipe into that. I can look immediately at taxi and see if I'm configured for takeoff. I have access to the quickest things that I'll need during the taxi phase of flight. Um, I can go to the startup and uh, I can make sure everything's ready for, for, for takeoff. I have not initialized the system, so some of the data is missing. Yeah. But uh, if I need to change a radio frequency, like oftentimes I'll leave it up over there in the radios because the pilot not flying on your side will take that. But if I don't have it up, I can just swipe it in and I can just go 23 5 shortcut into there and it changes the frequency for me. I can make these radios anything I want. I could put HF1 there if I wanted a higher high frequency radio for international or COM1. Um, if I needed to make a flight plan change, you know, I can just go direct to Craig um, and then activate that. It shows me what's going to delete, all those things. So the touch screens are great. Um, gets rid of most of the switches in the flight deck. I don't have MCDs anymore. I don't have an audio control panel. I don't have upfront controls of those things. It's all in there. Um, the other backbone of the airplane is the data concentration network. It t takes the traditional wiring system. So imagine, let's just say you're at oil pressure. You have a wire from the oil pressure sensor to the racks, and then another wire from the racks to up here. Um, and by the time you do that, for every publisher of information in the airplane, that's a lot of wires. So instead, we have a network. We have uh, you know, 14 network nodes. So all the publishers of information, temperatures, pressures, you know, door sensors, positions, all that stuff is connected to its closest network node. And okay. if it's important, it'll be connected to a couple of nodes. And then you just have those network cables coming up and, um, and it's networked. You know, not a difficult concept because our houses are kind of like that now. Um, but the great thing about those is those network nodes are also computers. Yeah. So you can do things like, hey, I see his engines are on. I see he just shut the door. <laughs> and I see he's rolling, I'm gonna turn on the transponder for him. You know, hey, I see he ran the engine switch to run, I'm gonna turn on the fuel pumps, yeah. I'm gonna turn on the, the beacon, which is what we do when we start engines. Um, and so all those medial tasks that, that we often did are now automatic and done for you. Okay. And you know, the biggest benefit, other than going, hey, that's cool, is that you get out of the chalks, you go from an airplane, totally dark, you know, to, to ready to take the runway, you know, in under 10 minutes, which is, which is great for a transport airplane. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we can do that even faster because all, there's no flows anymore. There's no, you know, procedures you got to memorize. We have, example, on the overhead panel, I have one test button. 
I hit that test button. It throws up a bunch of cast messages for the overheats and things. And I turn it off, I check my lights, and I have done all the tests that I need to do uh, before I start the engine, with the wow. exception of uh, flight controls. So there's no more of, individual tests for different systems? Correct. Everything correct. just... Yeah. Really two tests, the master test and the flight controls test. Okay. And then we're ready for engine start other than loading your flight plan. And most people download their flight plan from daily. That's pretty insane. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can see we have a three-dimensional moving map. So what happens is, you know, this is in the kind of the ground configuration. So if you look over here on this one, so once you take the runway, it's going to transition to your typical flight display like that. Okay. And then as you land, slowing down below about 60 knots, you're going to see it move back uh, to this version so you can see the high-speed taxiways it's dark it's rainy you're in, a, uh, in Hong Kong you don't know where you are and they say I need you to get off a of high-speed taxiway echo and you're like well where is that and you'll see all the signage and everything on here you'll also see it on the map That's awesome. yeah That's so incredible. we don't even need airport charts anymore uh, for the most part, we just use these, <laughs> these displays. Well, that's awesome. And, you know, runway incursions are uh, still a big issue in yeah. all, all aspects of aviation, so all that stuff is in there for you. Wow. Um, checklists, uh, new for the 700-800, all normals and abnormal checklists are all um, on any display I want, I just swipe up. So, for example, here's my power-up checklist. You know, the things with A's in them, auto sense. So, in this case, since we're doing a ground display, I haven't turned on the flight control batteries. But if they were, they would automatically check it themselves. And then I can even tell the airplane if I need a special condition, such as like cold weather. Um, like if I'm operating below minus 20C, there's certain things we do to warm up the engines and the displays. And that will insert all those procedures into like the power up checklist and the start checklist and wherever we need it. So we don't have to go dig in through the flight manual to say, hey, what do I need to do differently in cold weather or hot weather or QFE operations in Russia or things like that. But you can also just click on any cast message up here and uh, when I do that so uh, let's just pick something like stabilizer fill and that's because again my battery my flight control batteries are on and it instantly pops up the checklist here um, and then you can walk through it so uh, very intuitive checklist you know you, you guys know in flight training you know doing checklists accurately and precisely is always a challenge for people and uh, this really helps out a lot awesome yeah, that's incredible yeah. What's the, uh, what's the purpose for the dual HUD? Usually it's the, the captain seat that has yeah, but Yeah, great question. Um, I'll start off by saying that we're all like, I'm not sure we're going to need a, a HUD for the pilot not flying. Right. And we also have synthetic vision on here. So we have enhanced vision, okay. synthetic vision. Enhanced vision is the, uh, the EO camera um, used for getting credit to land below 200 feet uh, by using the runway lights. Um, when you don't break out and see them with the naked eye. Uh, synthetic vision is, you know, exactly that, showing all the synthetic vision outside. So you see mountain terrains, runway lead-in lines, the runway, all those things. Um, or you can blank it. So it gives you a whole lot of situational awareness, you know, especially if you are uh, in the mountains at night or even in just foggy, smoky weather, hazy weather. Uh, it's amazing what you can see. And all that to say is that with all the pilots to a person, love the HUD in the right seat, even when they're not flying. They right. love the synthetic vision uh, and all those functions. So it, it's a free option. In the, oh, it's not a free option. It's standard in the 700-800. Wow, okay. Yeah. 